So before we start, as I was finishing editing this podcast today, we got the news that uh, Michael Collins has unfortunately passed away. I'm going to read the statement. If you've not heard it uh, from from his family, we regret to share that our beloved father and grandfather passed away today after a valiant battle with cancer. He spent his final days peacefully with his family by his side. Mike always faced the challenges of life with grace and humility and faced this, his final challenge, in the same way. We will miss him terribly. Yet we also know how lucky Mike felt to have lived the life he did. We will honour his wish for us to celebrate, not mourn that life. Please join us in fondly and joyfully remembering his sharp wit, his quiet sense of purpose and his wise perspective gained both from looking back at Earth from the vantage of space and gazing across calm waters from the deck of his fishing boat. Our family asked for privacy during this difficult time. Details on services will be forthcoming. Obviously, uh, very upsetting news. Um, One of our absolute heroes, and I'm sure next week we will do a full tribute episode, but You've only got to look at social media and how many people are posting such wonderful, heartwarming posts celebrating him and their experiences of him to know that this wasn't just a historic astronaut. This was a really, really good person. We'll do our full tribute next week. But right now, here is episode 35. Another huge week in space news. But today we're taking a look at a true unsung hero. Gerard K. O'Neill, whose vision is undoubtedly behind much of what we see today. To do this, we speak to some of the production team of The High Frontier, a brand new movie all about the life of Gerard K. O'Neill. If you have any unsung heroes in the space world, we'd love to hear about them. Let us know on at Space and Things 1 on Twitter or get involved at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And please keep your comments and reviews coming in. But right now, whether you're out walking, in your car, sitting back at home relaxing, or taking some personal time at work, we hope you enjoy episode 35 of the Space and Things Podcast. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 35 of our podcast. Now, Emily, we've got loads to get through today, but it would be a disservice if we don't mention the fact that For All Mankind Season 2 has finished. Uh, and yeah. hope, hopefully people have watched it. <laughs> Uh, we won't be any spoilers, but if you've watched it, now you know what we've been talking about. And wow, what an ending. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I actually did watch it again uh, this last week just to sort of, you know, remind myself. And uh, I, oh boy, I, I, like I said, I don't want to add any spoilers, but I, I started sobbing like I actually knew the people... <laughs> like I actually knew the people in the show. So yeah, it's intense. Uh that being said, I'm probably a little biased because it's all it's been one of my favorite shows since it first uh, debuted uh, to, in 2019. But uh, I absolutely thought this season was incredible. And uh, I, I can't wait for season three. I hope there's a uh, alternate space and things on For All Mankind, <laughs> maybe. No, I don't know if... um. Next season, that it's the 90s, so they don't, maybe not, but who knows, maybe the season after, maybe season four, they'll have an alternate space and things, who knows, that yeah. would be cool. It certainly is interesting how they jump 10 years every time, and it'll be interesting to see how they use the, the original cast within that and age them 10 years, uh, having already aged them 10 years. Uh, I think that will be interesting to see, but I tell you what I have enjoyed this week is uh, Chris Marshall, one of the actresses, her tweets have been amazing, load of behind the scenes stuff. I know a few of them have been doing it on Instagram, but I tend to be on on Twitter more these days, so I've seen more of what Chris Marshall has posted, and there's been some incredible stuff that she's posted. Uh, it's been really enjoyable seeing all of that and her excitement, and and by the looks of it, the whole whole of the cast, their excitement about being a part of this project. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun online this week. But yeah, seeing people's reactions to that final episode and even the small little clips they've posted on their own for mankind social media has got me going because I know what it's on about. It's ah, it's crazy. So if you've not watched it yet, we both of us really do recommend uh, watching that show or listen to our preview of it <laughs> from a few weeks back. Uh, but I think we should uh, just get on with uh, our today's feature. What do you say, Emily? 
Yep, let's let's crack on then. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's been a while since it has I, uh, been. It has been. Yeah, it's been a while. All right. On April 17th, a new movie called The High Frontier, The Untold Story of Gerard K. O'Neill had a free global live premiere. And to discuss the film and to talk a bit more about Jerry, we are joined by executive producer Dylan Taylor, uh, director uh, Ryan State, and producer and co-writer uh, Will Henry. Right, so before we get into this interview, here is a little bit about O'Neill uh, for those who may not have heard much about him in bef- before or are unaware of, of his work. So in 1956, at the age of 29, he started research into high-energy particle physics at Princeton University and essentially invented particle accelerators, uh, which, and pardon my pun here, eventually propelled him to become a Mm -hmm. full professor of physics by 1965. He applied to be an astronaut in 1966 when NASA opened up the process to civilian scientists, and he very nearly made it, but due to budget cuts, they limited how many scientists they let in, so he didn't quite make the cut. In 1969, he started becoming interested in space colonization, and he posed the following question to his students in a seminar. Is the surface of a planet really the right place for an expanding technological civilization? And the answer from his students seemed to be no. Inspired by the papers written by his students, he eventually published many papers on the topic and organized a conference titled The First Conference on Space Colonization, of which an article appeared about on the front of the New York Times in May 1974. And after that, he became a little bit of a star, appearing on a number of talk shows and even setting up his own Space Studies Institute in 1977, uh, a non-profit organization at Princeton to research technologies needed for space manufacturing and settlement. Also in 1977, he published his first book, The High Frontier, Human Colonies in Space, which combined fictional accounts of space settlers with an explanation of his plan to build space colonies. Whole grassroots communities built up around the ideas expressed in this book. Uh, The technology did exist. It just needed the will of someone or the government to make it happen. Uh, Unfortunately, O'Neill was diagnosed with leukemia in 1985, and he died on April 27, 1992, uh, 29 years ago today as we record this. Uh, His stories and the ideas he came up with and presented to the world are really now beginning to take shape. But ultimately, not enough people realize that it was O'Neill who planted the seed in so many minds, which is why it's so positive that this film is coming out. So let's now hear from the filmmakers. Okay, we're off to a good start. Play it cool. Welcome to Will Henry, Dylan Taylor and Ryan State. To Space and Things, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for talking about the new film, The High Frontier, which is about the life of Gerard K. O'Neill. So, Director Ryan, I'll start with you. How did this film come about? Were you all fans of uh, G.K. O'Neill beforehand, or was this something you stumbled upon and decided this was a story you just had to tell? Well, I think we were all big fans before this came out, um, but it was really the start of Dylan's genius that wanted to make this the documentary um, and I'm so happy he did because this was the perfect, perfect time to have something like this come out with all that's going on in the world and the message that this evokes is exactly what Jerry was trying to get across his whole life. So Dylan tells the story the best, I think, of how it started this, since he started this whole thing himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, th- thanks for that. And uh, still in speaking, I uh, appreciate the kind uh, words, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, it's probably like all great stories. It started with a, with a, uh, with a story in a, in itself. I was talking actually to Rick Tomlinson, who many of you probably know. We were having a long uh, weekend conversation and he was telling me the story about the early days of the L5 Society and his activities with the Space Studies Institute and Jerry O'Neill and so forth and so on. And, and I said, well, wait a second, I'm not exactly sure I, I know that story and I'm not exactly sure I know some of the key characters you're describing. And, and so of course he, he educated me on some of the early, early days of that movement. And I got off the phone with them really lamenting the fact that being a lifelong space, not in, and very affectionate about the industry that I knew so little about the early years of the industry and sort of what had motivated, let's say Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or others. And I thought to myself, what a shame that that story hasn't been told. 
And I kind of left it in the back of my mind. Well, maybe a couple months down the road, uh, Jerry's name came up again in some other context. And I thought to myself, you know what? This is a story really we really need to get out there. I, I know what it was, actually. It was uh, when uh, Elon and SpaceX and team had relanded their first rocket booster. And, and he was getting a lot of fanfare, as he should. And I was thinking to myself, well, New Space hasn't started today. It started a while back. And there were a lot of giants that these giants are standing on the shoulders of. And that was sort of the impetus for the film. And so with that, um, I started reaching out to so-called Jerry's kids. Uh, these were people Rick and others had identified as being inspired by Jerry and asked them if they'd be willing to go on camera. Um, and that was sort of the original idea was to do sort of an interview series. And then from there, it really morphed into a much, much larger multi-year film project and, and, and a companion book. So the the thing, um, this film really introduced viewers, a lot of people who probably just didn't know much about him to to Jerry, who the regular guy, you know, um, the father, the husband, the pilot, uh, the guy who posed by an alarming amount of hot rods and cars and stuff like that. Um, so what is your uh, do you guys have any favorite, you know, Jerry stories you may have heard during the filming? I mean, God, so many come to mind. But the one that really jumps out at me is that um, there was this really unique um prism that i saw jerry holding yeah. in so many photos um and he would usually make it out of either matchsticks or um uh pencils or 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 dominoes or what have you um and i kept seeing it in photos and i kept thinking you know is this some sort of like secret society symbol that i hadn't <laughs> caught on to yet in the making of the movie and we kept going and going and going i think halfway through the production I just was like, I got to ask Tasha O'Neill. And she was like, oh, I know exactly what that is. Um, and it, where we ended up putting it in the book, the full story. But basically, he would um, he attended a party with one of his, um, a professor he looked up to at Princeton. And he had a trick that he was trying to get students to, to um, figure out during, during the course of the party. No one figured it out. He knew it the whole time. He knew the answer Jerry did. At the end of, end of it, he walked up, put these prism, this uh, kind of matchstick prism together and proved how there was this sort of unexpected dimension that they weren't seeing. Um, and it became sort of this through line through how he had attacked all the, the, the more scientific and practical math problems in, in, in his career, which was not to look at it just like face value. What's the unexpected dimension I'm not seeing here? Um, and that finally um, uh, explained a lot of what I kept seeing. It was a real honor when Will and I went to see the family and they just opened their arms to us and they hadn't really been together in a long time talking about Jerry. And it was really an emotional moment for all of us to bring them together and witness their, you know, their stories and have them get their word, the word out there, of what they wanted to say about the legacy that their father had left behind. And it was just really, really touching. I'm glad we were able to do that. So let's let's go a little far back. Let's go to around uh, 1974, around the time that the first uh, big article came out about uh, Jerry and his vision in the New York Times, uh, and that kind of uh, set the pace for his uh, popularity. Why do you think he developed such a following after that article, and why do you think he had such a following in like a lot of diverse groups? The the time, you know, as we were in the Vietnam War, we had environmental issues we had you know threatening of nuclear wars uh many many issues power issues we, all these things he was able to articulate in technically and environmentally sound ways that i think spoke to that generation you know he was able to have nasa grab onto the science of it and have the artists grab onto the vision of it and it started a, a, a movement that is still going today. Yeah, I, I would just add, Emily, I think Ryan nailed it. Um, but I think all great legacies sort of win the hearts and the minds. And, you know, Jerry was as smart as they come, as we know. I mean, he was an uber genius, Nobel Prize uh, type intellect. Um, so his principles were grounded in science, uh, in the classroom, in the physics first principles classroom at Princeton. But yet he was a visionary and he touched people and he was charismatic and he was a, a communicator. And so I think if you marry the, as Ryan just said, the time, uh, which matters, uh, the timing of his movement, 
plus who Jerry was winning the hearts and minds. I think you tie that all together. And that piece really was more of a coming out party, uh, as I understood it, just more of a validation of, of a movement that had already been created prior to the article being written. Uh, so that, that's, that's what I see. Of course, I was, I guess, three years old at the time, so I wasn't around, but, but that's, uh, for the people who were there, that's that's sort of how they tell the story. Um, the High Frontier, the book, was was released over 40 years ago. It was released in the mid-70s, I think 77. Um, what, and it's, I mean, it still stands the test of time today, I think. Um, what qualities do you think the book has that make it still relevant to this day, even though it was published, I hate to, <laughs> it was published before I was alive. <laughs> um, I think there's a, few aspects to why it still stands up, which is why, you know, we ended up putting out a, a special movie edition of the book, which we have a limited copy of, which you can actually find on our site. And I think, Emily, you might have already bought one. I haven't yet, but I I'm, okay. I, I probably <laughs> will. I'm, I'm embarrassed to, I'll just say it. I don't even <laughs> care. I have like five damn copies of that book, so I'll probably buy another one. So what, yeah. whatever. It doesn't well, matter. I know Dave's just dying. <laughs> I'll probably buy another one. Well, and, you know, I think part of the reason we did that was because it's still worth the read. It's still the same book it was it, it, as it was back in the day. And I think that's part, I think there's kind of two parts to that. And I think it's one part is that the technical aspects of it are still true. There's nothing that we have gone past. We haven't, we haven't superseded any sort of um, technical advancement that is just a, a bygone by now. Um, that said, the other part is that he knew that this was going to be brought on by, uh, by private citizens. And whether or not they brought that to the government to do, it was going to either be that or private citizens were going to take their own financial capital and go do it themselves, which is ironically what has happened. Well, Jerry was an environmentalist, you know, and I, those still hold as strong as well. Like people will say that technical stuff holds strong and so does the environmental issues. They're still with us. And this is a way to express to everyone how we get to a pl place where we can solve these problems. I think that's a real issue and a real tough thing to explain to an audience is why space is important. That's one of the important things about this movie is, you know, explain to your grandmother or someone, why are we spending billions of dollars constantly on going to space when there's homeless people on every corner and, you know, we're in a pandemic. But the point is it's important because we can solve all these problems that we're having on earth if we can get out and take the baby steps to start developing space resources and, you know, moving on in our human evolution to uh, expand, we can't be here forever. Obviously, uh, and this is touched upon in the, in the, the new biography that uh, Dylan has written about O'Neill and also obviously in the movie, but unfortunately we, uh, we all know that um, O'Neill died fairly young. He died in 1992. So that was almost 30 years ago. He really sadly kind of faded into a sort of obscurity after he died. You know, he's not as well known as Carl Sagan or somebody else from that era. Mm -hmm. Was that a challenge when you guys were putting together this project? And were there any other challenges you didn't expect? Uh, I'm just thinking about, you know, how many people from that time who probably worked with Jerry who aren't around anymore who were or who were. I know Freeman Dyson was, you know, he was in his 90s at the time of filming. So did that, you know, pose any challenges and what other challenges did you guys maybe run into, you know, as far as maybe getting, you know, archival footage or, or whatever? It's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think, Emily, without the family, this this film would not exist. Right. So Tasha was just amazing in terms of access to, you know, photos and documents and connecting us with people who could be on camera who might might've been a little hesitant, but once they knew the family was on board and once they knew we were going to honor the legacy of, of Jerry, I think uh, people became much more comfortable. Uh, Jerry had an unpublished autobiography that no one knew existed uh, that Tasha shared with us really for, for context. Um, I mean, just very, you know, very personal, very deep information that Tasha uh, trusted us with uh, really just to illuminate the kind of person he was, what threads we might want to pull on, uh, so I would say it was, it was very, very challenging film to make, but probably not for the reason that he, you know, was less uh, well-known than Carl Sagan. It was more because mm -hmm. there were so many interesting uh, aspects of his life that we wanted to investigate. Uh, and that's frankly why it took, you know, three years to, to make the film. I mean, it really was, uh, 
a labor of love. And I think, I don't know, Ryan would, would know the, the answer to this, but I think we have something like 300 hours of footage. Um, wow. <laughs> uh, may, may, maybe more, maybe more. Um, that's awesome. And I don't think Ryan gets enough credit for really making this a magnificent film. Uh, we did, we did come to him, you know, with an idea, we did come to him with sort of a format. We did come to him with footage, but it was really Ryan that uh, really put the final masterpiece together. So I just really want to express my gratitude to him. Thanks for that, Dylan. Um, yeah, it was an interesting way to start a documentary because we came to it with so much great interviews from Will and Dylan that I was able to go through all that, you know, and figure out a basic storyline that we had to find footage for or images. Um, so Will and I did a deep dive with SSI and got into their archives into the, all their nooks and crannies and drawers and <laughs> really pulled out as much as we could and just scanned like crazy people for months, you know, animating and cleaning up old photos. Uh, then Will and I went to Princeton and he, he had, you know, was at Princeton. He knew his way around there and got into all their archives easily. And we ended up with a lot of great stuff, a lot of stuff we couldn't even put in the film. But yeah. um, I'm really happy with what we ended up with. What do you hope um, endures the most concerning Jerry's legacy? And um, you guys have kind of, obviously you've touched on this a little bit, you know, about uh, private uh, people starting, you know, their own endeavors, their own rocket companies. How long of a way do you think we have to go until we see the vision that he came up with? Uh, I see it coming in leaps and bounds. I mean, I remember just 10 years ago, I was watching these little companies out in the desert make little rockets that were only, you know, 30 feet tall going up and down vertically. And I thought it was just like science fiction coming to life. It was amazing. And jump 10 years later, we're taking private citizens <laughs> to the space station already. I think it's... Uh, moving pretty quickly. And we have companies like Axiom now doing their own private space stations, uh, all kinds of crazy things that are happening. Uh, it's like, I think you'd be very proud to see how fast it's happening. I really hope, uh, a big goal for me with this movie was to inspire the younger generation and to open this up to, you know, people of all, from, from, from everywhere, all around the world, different races, you know, men, women, everything. It just, we wanted to, you know, um, change the concept of this being about just a bunch of old white guys doing doing stuff in space. We really wanted to inspire the younger generation. Um, and I really hope that that continues to evolve over time. And we really tried to underline that in the film with, with, with touching on what it meant to be with Jerry at that time, but also what, it, what to, to people who are reading him for the first time, like myself, when we came to make this film. Um, so I really hope that that also continues to, to grow because I see a lot of great, wonderful, humanistic, values that 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 jerry uh that the, the undercurrent today's um system because of what jerry wrote in his book um and i just i really hope that that continues yeah, yeah i agree i just i would just add one, one final thought i mean i've probably received about 200 emails from people around the world just you know thanking us for making the film i bet you two-thirds of those are from people in their 30s and maybe younger 20s and 30s uh saying this inspired me i had no idea um, you know, thank you for, you know, making a film and, and illuminating such a, uh, you know, great, great person, great leader, great inspirer, great visionary, which is exactly the whole point of making the movie. So I hope that, um, I hope that gets traction. And of course, you know, we have the two richest humans on planet earth really committed to implementing Jerry's ideas. I mean, Jer Bezos is certainly more of an O'Neillian uh, than Musk would be, but, you know, Elon's still pushing the envelope as we know. And what he's doing is going to enable a lot of the O'Neillian vision. So I think I feel pretty good about the future. Uh, I really do. I was, just going to, I was just going to add a little bit to that as I was very surprised while doing the music, putting together the music for this movie, which became a compilation of a lot of uh, electronic music that used sounds from the era. And it, um, a lot of people that I had been listening to for years now just seemed to fit. So I thought, well, let's just, use the community of musicians and just, you know, that they're all space enthusiasts. So uh, calling them up and doing the research on getting them to be in the film, I was shocked to see that uh, they 
had, they knew who Jerry was, a lot of them. And a lot of them actually had read the book. It surprised me because I, I realized that his movement, his, his uh, story is kind of in there underground still. And this is just waiting to, to make it blossom. Yeah. Now, I'm a musician. Uh, maybe one day I'll write a decent song, but there's no guarantee that anyone will hear it. It's a very overcrowded world at the moment. It's difficult to to get the word out. Now, you've made a great film about an unsung hero where it's even more difficult because they're not in the headlines. A lot of people don't necessarily know who he is. That must pose you some problems. Have you found it difficult to market this movie? And what have you found to be the most effective way of getting the word out about this and to try and inspire people to even want to watch it? This feels like a tough question. Is there even an answer to this? I don't know. Well, I don't think there is. I mean, certainly word of mouth is the most powerful. Um, there are some luminaries who like the film, include, including presumably Bezos, who's in it. Um, so we're, you know, we're working on trying to get, you know, it, it's like any kind of media, right? You're, you're trying to cut through the noise of uh, the world. Uh, so it, it is difficult. Uh, that being said, I think we're pretty pleased with how the reception has been. Um, but if you have any ideas, we're, we're, we're all ears. Um, <laughs> right now, the good news is it's on, it's on all major platforms, which is a big win. Um, mm. As you probably are aware, distribution is the key challenge with any film. And we were very pleased that uh, Vertical Entertainment agreed to distribute the film. Um, so that, you know, that helps a great deal, but really Will and Ryan are more on the, uh, on the filmmaking marketing side. So they might have a better answer for me uh, as a musician as well. That's one, one step I'm taking is just collaborating with other musicians that are in the, the industry, um, doing a kind of a music for space project, you know, with people like everyday astronaut and, um, doing something with Mary Liz Bender, getting the word out there through the music channels and also um, Kyle Schimber, who's another producer in the film who I have the company with. He has been just going nuts on Clubhouse in rooms with like, you know, 3000 people and Richard Branson's in there and they're all talking about the film and it's, there's young people and old people. And it's, it's a big mix of um, di just different areas. And it's, it's going to have its own kind of underground yeah. build, I, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, there's really just a two remaining parts. You guys hit all of them there. Um, the two remaining parts that I see that, that are actually kind of under the umbrella of what I do over at Multiverse, which is that um, we do have a social media engine behind this. And it's a really a really strong and effective one. And it's been very effective for us. Um, the, the premiere, I think we had thousands of people tune in from all, all over the world. And then sales have already been way more than we expected. Um, and then the other part really is that, you know, we really want to get this out to students, you know, and, and whether that's going to be a college tour or making some sort of um, site availability for students to log in and watch it to, for a discounted price, something like that. That's really important. And I think that's that's I think when people when students realize that there's a, a film as flashing as fun as this available to them, they're going to watch it. I, I absolutely uh, love the movie. I thought it was fantastic. And I hope we see uh, directors maybe a director's cut with some uh, stuff that we haven't maybe seen yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe some of the, some extended interviews, but uh, I just thought it was amazing. We might have to do an Emily cut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would probably, I would probably drop dead. Well, we oh have enough God. extra interviews too. I'll yeah. tell you. <laughs> yeah. I would probably drop dead. <laughs> well, thanks very much for joining us to talk about the movie. Uh, this has been amazing. I really love this movie as well. So good luck with it all. And uh, we hope to hear from you again in future. Thanks a lot, Dave. Great. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. When people put their minds to it, they can make things happen extraordinarily fast. The whole Apollo project was not even 10 years from the start of the concept to the successful realization. Almost anything that's technically within present possibility can be done within a 10 year time span when people set their minds to it. What did you think about the movie and everything? Okay, so this movie is wonderful. This movie is absolutely wonderful and I'm so glad we got to talk to the, to the filmmakers there. Uh, it, if you have not seen it, it's available uh, on Apple TV and Google Play and uh, amongst other places. We'll obviously post links. But it's really inspiring. Now, I didn't know too much about Gerard K. O'Neill 
until fairly recently, uh, over the last couple of years, his name's been coming up a little bit more and I've been doing a bit more research. But this film is has come at the perfect time and it feels, Emily, like with everything that's going on in the space world right now, it's really important that we're remembering him and acknowledging what he did and what he wrote and how he inspired people and how he started all these communities and uh, and this work that has led to a lot of what we're seeing now. Absolutely. Uh, I've studied the life and career of O'Neill for probably about 18 months now, just because a, a couple of years ago I was inspired like, man, why does anybody write about people who didn't fly in space? Like everybody, I've been writing about, you know, astronauts and stuff, but I wanted to sort of do something about people who had an influence in the space community, but never actually went to space. Mm. So I selected two scientists. Uh, I selected O'Neill and uh, Brian O'Leary, who was in the astronaut class that O'Neill applied for that O'Neill just barely didn't make the cut for. And O'Leary and O'Neill actually worked together uh, quite a bit because after... O'Leary quit NASA. He and uh, O'Neill still stayed in touch and they were very friendly. The whole time I've been sort of studying his life and his career, I've been just kind of like, why isn't he, you know, a household name like Carl Sagan? You know, because yeah. around the same time O'Neill was doing his thing, you know, he was on The Tonight Show, he was on TV, he was on PBS uh, in the United States, he was on PBS's Nova, which, you know, is kind of like a, a science minded and oriented show. And he was on TV and, you know, in magazines and books quite a bit from the late 70s to throughout the 80s, kind of writing about him. I was like, gosh, why didn't he become like a star like, you know, Carl Sagan? Carl Sagan's died probably like 25 years ago. So a little bit after O'Neill, but uh, he's still very, you know, famous. There, there's kind of a, a, dare I say it, like a cult around Sagan, but uh, not as much around O'Neill. In fact, I felt I've often felt like, you know, why did O'Neill sort of fade into, like, obscurity? A couple takeaways from the movie. Uh, first, I feel like I really, even though I've been sort of studying his life and work, I feel like I got to meet him for the first time because I got to see a lot of film clips that I hadn't seen, mm. which was wonderful. I, you know, just seeing somebody talk and sort of gesticulate and stuff like that. It's a little beyond just looking at pictures of them and yeah. um, stuff like that. And some of the footage on YouTube is pretty limited. It's nice to have a little bit of more conversation from the person himself. And it was lovely to see sort of Jerry, the human being, his pinup photos of himself with various airline, you know, airplanes and hot cars, you know, just stuff like that. Jerry, like the late, you know, the mod late 60s. Yeah, he had that. He had that mod haircut, didn't he? Yeah, he had the Beatles <laughs> he was haircut. Very fashionable. He was kind of like the hip dad, you know, yeah. the hip dad of the late <laughs> 60s. Well, he's different from a regular dad. He's a cool dad. <laughs> he would let you like probably, you know, drink a glass of wine in the house or something. But seriously, though, it was really neat to see him as a person versus somebody you read about in a book. Yeah. You know, because sometimes I think when I write about people, it's like I try to humanize them, but it's nice to see them actually in action and talking and, you know, just being a human being. And um, the second takeaway I got from the film was just and I think it's even more moving than. Um, hearing about Jerry the person is just how many people whose lives he really impacted. I, I don't think in his lifetime he felt he really knew that. This mm. was um, a really kind of a, a, I hate the pardon the pun, down to earth, sort of, a, you know, very humble person. You know, if you see the movie, if you hear him talk, he was kind of soft spoken. Not a Carl Sagan personality, not somebody who's more like theatrical, I guess. I think part of that is why he's not as remembered because he was kind of a quieter, you know, not he didn't promote himself as much. Yeah, it's really beautiful to see like the impact on so many people that he left, including some of the people now who are really writing the future of aerospace as much as we criticize them. You know, we got Elon Musk, who's launching civilians to space, which is something that's kind of been a dream for a very long time. And we got somebody like Jeff Bezos, who's talking about more like O'Neill settlements. And I know they're rivals, <laughs> uh, as evidenced by Twitter yesterday. But um, I think it's great that they both are doing things to try to get us back, you know, to space and sort of expand the human presence in, in space. Because really, we all we all live in space, man. Earth is part of space.
Yeah, absolutely. I love the, the the quote from the from the interview from Dylan, uh, f- from from Dylan Taylor, where he, he called them O'Neillian in their views. Yeah. I thought that was such a a, a great use of language uh, to see. Actually, yeah, they are, and and this is a, a theme of the of um of the film is how um the current people involved in making space technology are the children of O'Neill metaphorically obviously um but his his reach was that important and what it did and how it has inspired people even if you haven't even read O'Neill's books uh the images of space colonies that we still see today have all come from those original works of Jared O'Neill so while you will be familiar with his work, you might not know that it was O'Neill who came up with it and basically said, exactly. we can do this. We can do this now. And he was saying that back in the 70s. We can do this now. We've got the technology. We've just got to have the will. I found that quite inspiring. Also loved how they brought it up to date and showed how it's, it's coming together now and, and, and how it's all, that the fruits of that labor are all, all beginning to, uh, to be revealed so yeah, I, I'm, exactly. I, it's it's get quite emotional at the end, and I love how the family are involved. I know that was mentioned in the interview as well. The family are so wonderful in this, and and as you say, it paints that bigger picture of uh, of Gerard the person. I I am surprised this film got made, but I love that it got made, and I hope that people watch it because I think it is an important story, and I think people will be surprised how much of what we do today comes from his ideas and his the way he planted those seeds. I've said that a few times. I need new metaphors. I need a new metaphor book, Emily. <laughs> I get it. No, I get it. Uh, I, I also wanted to add, even though it was really heartbreaking for me when they talked about his final illness and everything, Yeah, I was just blown away at how, you know, they were like, okay, you got 18 months, right? And yeah. he was like, I'm not accepting that. And he went seven, seven more years. years. Yeah. When I heard that, I honestly didn't know that. I knew that he had had leukemia and I knew that he was ill, but I didn't know it, at the beginning it was that bad. I had no idea. So to hear that he was basically like, I'm not accepting that. And he went seven more years, six years beyond his diagnosis. He had a lot of life to live and he did a lot during that time. Yeah. It wasn't just that he lived, he was still contributing so much as well. The the words the triumph of the heart really just kept coming up in my mind. I'm sure at times he just his body was not willing, but his he was like, I gotta do this. I gotta do this. He had sort of a secondary strength, I guess. That was greatly moving for me as well. As somebody with a chronic illness and some I hate saying that, it sounds like attention seeking, but all of us wake up some days. And we're like, damn, I just don't feel like doing yeah, anything, yeah, 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 <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. We all wake up some days and we're like, I'm tired. You know, I just want to go back to bed I, or, I, you know, whatever. I just want to stay in pajamas, especially in the last year, you Absolutely. know, with everything that's been yeah. happening. You know, it's been very soul annihilating. And it's like, and hearing a story about somebody like that who's been given, you know, a pretty heavy, pretty heavy sentence, yet he was like, okay, I'm not accepting this and I'm just going to keep working. I found that just quite inspiring inspiring yeah Yeah. so yeah yeah so if you don't know anything about gerard k o'neill then watch this movie or if you think you do know a lot about gerard k o'neill then watch this movie uh (laughs) because they've really done a great job i'm so as i said earlier i'm so glad they made it it's really good and thank you to dylan ryan and will for joining us i think that we have to understand that at the deepest possible level opening the high frontier means making possible and ensuring the survival of the human race. So, as we said at the top of the show, there has been so much going on in the world of space this week. Four launches, uh, of which the highlight was the launch of crew two, of the Crew 2 mission on Friday the 23rd of April. Now, we discussed this uh, a little bit in last week's show. There are two NASA astronauts and one each from the European Space Agency and from the Japanese Space Agency as well. Uh, they have flown together to the International Space Station on board the Endeavour Dragon capsule on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket early on Friday morning. And the views were absolutely delightful. Emily, you got up to watch this, right? Yes, I did. Uh, Oh, my God. It was incredible. I was not really expecting uh, much because I live about 130 miles out in St. Petersburg. Um, But I did get up because I was like, well, I'll see a streak and that's better than nothing. So I got up. I I have to say, and I hate this sounds so like 
it was better in the old days. It, <laughs> but shuttle launches were still pretty incredible to watch from here. You could see a lot. But uh, the Falcon 9 is a little smaller, but I was not expecting much. I was just expecting to see like an orange streak, you know, and that was it. Because it was near sunrise, the sunlight sort of bounced off the propellant. So we got an incredible view. It, I got to see uh, basically the Dragon capsule going away from us. And you could see the propellant coming off of it. And it was just like, what? And then it gets better. You, on, the, on the right, I saw another streak. And I was like, are they okay up there? And I checked my phone, you know, and I didn't have any weird messages. So I'm like, okay. And then I realized that was the first stage coming back. Wow. And I could see the propellant coming off of it. And it, I could see it like descending. And I was like, holy crap. I did not think I could see that from here because. Um, 130 miles. It's a ways out. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the rest by the time that's coming back down. Yeah. So I did not. I was not expecting that. But uh, I did get it uh, on my phone. And I think I did post it to Space Hipsters. It, it, it's not the greatest video in the world. But um, it sort of shows what I saw. But I was like, oh, my God, that's inc that's beautiful. So I'm so happy I woke up to see that. It was it was uh, probably the most beautiful sight that honestly I've seen during a launch. Wow. It really wow, was. Wow. And I've seen a lot of them. The images of the of the night launches and, and those early dusk and dawn launches always look spectacular. But to to know that it's actually as good in real life as some of the cameras pick up is, is good to know. I'm sure it's probably better in real life than the cameras pick up, but uh, it's it, they just it looks spectacular. It's like the whole sky is coming alive uh, with this blue halo almost. It was. It was just incredible. It was really beautiful to watch. Mm. Now, I have, I have two other things I want to discuss about this briefly. The whole Launch America branding that they're doing really confuses me, and like to the point where they've they've now painted it on the front of the VA, uh, the Vehicle Assembly Building. Oh, wow. And I think I kind of got it for the first launch of Bob and Doug last summer, but now I don't really get it, especially having read Teasel's, uh, Teasel Muir Harmony's book about space diplomacy, where all the research suggests that waving nationalism in the rest of the world's face while doing space stuff just rubs them up the wrong way and doesn't actually further progress the program as it should especially when 50 percent of the crew of this mission yeah aren't american. Even american it doesn't make sense to me that this is being put so much in the forefront of of the branding of these launches that are, that are happening i'm not sure if you've got any views on that but as an englishman i just found it a bit odd um, I agree with you because uh, 50 percent of the crew wasn't even American. You had a European astronaut and you had a Japanese astronaut. So um, I thought that was kind of funky, you know, because I'm like the thing about the International Space Station is that it's supposed to be sort of a hub uh, for many different countries to work together. And I just think, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of weird myself. Um, it's just I think, unnecessary. I think it's a carryover from probably the last administration. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Now, as I said, I've been reading this book and all the evidence suggests that it's just not the best tactic. And I don't really understand what NASA thinks they're getting from promoting this brand. Yeah, I think it's weird. Um, as you know, as, as somebody who likes... Uh, I appreciate all the space agencies. Uh, I think space is positive i don't really honestly um i've seen some really messed up posts on the internet about you know oh the chinese and you know and people are getting all threatened about the chinese and they're gonna beat us and i'm like let's say they do build their own space station or go to the moon okay you know <laughs> they'll have yeah. somebody on the moon it doesn't uh, we still went first in the 60s i don't see yeah, why yeah, yeah. i'm not gonna bad mouth that you know i mean uh, i'm not I, I view anyone going to space, I view humanity going to space as positive. I uh, I appreciate everybody's participation in space. You know, we got Thomas Pesquet back in space. Uh, you know, the ESA astronaut, he's really funny. You know, he does a lot of little funny things from space. Uh, he's kind of a friend of our group, uh, Space Hipster. So it's nice to see somebody who's around my age see, you know, sort of their perspective and see what they're seeing because God knows yeah. I'm probably never going to see it. Yeah, we've just spent a load of time talking about Jiraki O'Neill and his visions for space and and how the whole idea is of these space colonies and getting more people up there is to make people realize that the borders we've got down on, on Earth are arbitrary. 
in the grand scheme of things. And the more people we can get up there and see in this world from afar, uh, and the, the more resources we can create up there, the less need there will be for all this division and hatred of one country versus another or promotion of one country versus another. Uh, you need to see this movie. Anyway, also, there was a story about some space junk nearly hitting the, the Dragon Capsule as well. Yeah, uh, there was. As it, as it made its way, which is pretty crazy. Uh, I don't know too much about it, and I think it will prove that it wasn't that close. But still, I wonder how long it's going to be until someone really gets to grips with this. And hopefully it won't take a disaster for for finally people to take this stuff seriously and and something to be done i know there are little things being planned and stuff but is it really being taken as seriously as it should be yeah i'm not so sure yeah exactly um there is a picture uh thomas pesquet actually took and granted he probably had a big you know a, a giant lens on a camera so that's he probably had quite you know a distance away from it but he was like hey i see our our second stage and i'm like what (laughs) like yeah what? Shouldn't that be further out? You know, and I'm sure he was using a zoom lens, so um, it was probably a few hundred miles away, so it was probably nothing to worry about, but still, I'm just like, I uh, want it to be further away from you guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I don't want to see it at all, you know? I don't yeah. want to see it, you know? So, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I sound uneducated to some people, like, they're because they're probably, like, it was several, it wasn't a threat to them, and I know that, but I still don't want to see it. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm, I feel the same. Anyway, also on Sunday, 25th of April, a Soyuz 2.1B rocket from Russia carrying some more OneWeb satellites, which you may remember we discussed a few weeks back, launched into space. And on Monday night, uh, United Launch Alliance launched a US defense satellite on a Delta IV heavy rocket from Vandenberg. And the photos and videos of that are delightful. I love that. Seriously, the, the, there's a photo... And it doesn't look real. It's overseen mm-hmm. on California, but it looks fake, but it's real. And I love it. Anyway, uh, and earlier today, as we record this on the 27th of April, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation launched a Long March 6 rocket carrying a number of different satellites for some different companies. As always, the links to the videos and information for all these launches will be in our show notes. And next week, it looks like we might have another four launches too. Everything seems to be going up. Yeah, uh- uh, we're always busy uh, <laughs> talking about uh, different space launches, so there's a lot going on. So many different companies as well. It's great, isn't it? Different companies, different countries. As we were just saying, it's great. It is great. Uh, with that said, uh, there are currently 11 people on the ISS, and the Crew-1 team will be coming back to Earth in the next week. So we've got a splashdown party to look forward to, although this has been uh, already delayed due to weather so hopefully i have not cursed it with some more delays um <laughs> we'll s- fingers crossed the reverse curse <laughs> <laughs> right now we can't come back <laughs> also also there's been two more flights by the ingenuity helicopter on mars and it's still looking really great and every new image is just blowing my mind um absolutely loving it uh we're also going to be seeing another test flight of SpaceX's Starship with their uh SN15 prototype on the pad and it's already performing static fire tests so keep your eyes peeled on social media for news about that because those launches are also worth watching. Yeah, always always a a, a good watch although not always for the right reasons. Um talking <laughs> to SpaceX, oh it's been reported that uh, and Emily made mention of this earlier that Jeff Bezos of uh, Blue Origin has filed a protest about the fact that SpaceX got awarded the next lunar lander contract for the Artemis program. Now we discussed this briefly last week and pointed out that the original plan was to have two different companies develop one of these at this stage from the three that were originally chosen, but budget issues have made NASA to speed up the process. Now, Blue Origin have said that NASA moved the goalposts at the last minute and that that decision, and I quote, eliminates opportunities for competition, significantly narrows the supply base and not only delays, but also endangers America's return to the moon. Elon Musk of SpaceX has countered this with a silly tweet saying, can't get it up to orbit. 
lol. Uh, <laughs> but also in a statement to the Washington Post, which ironically is owned by Jeff Bezos, said the Blue Origin bid was just way too high. Double that of SpaceX and SpaceX has much more hardware progress. He also said this about Bezos. I think he needs to run Blue Origin full time for it to be successful. And frankly, I hope he does. Now, having just spent some time talking about Gerard K. O'Neill and his visions uh, and how they've been taken up by these two companies and the fact I've previously said I like how these companies all seem to be supporting each other even though they're competition the whole thing has left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth not sure about you Emily uh yeah it did I didn't like that tweet that um <laughs> the tweet was awful yeah the t- it, it was just like stupid it's like okay guys just chill like just you know play nice and try to play nice um yeah and uh, normally they do and normally exactly. they do about each other don't they so it was really like i will not say an out of character because he does seem to do these things i think i think he does it because he knows people are going to talk yeah. about it but there's a there was an element of no 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 about it it's like oh come on grow up you're not a kid yeah i i kind of i really personally hate it when he does stuff like this because same the spacex diehards they love it they eat it up they think it's the greatest thing on earth and it's like and start acting like that themselves. They think it's cool to act like that. And it's like, you know, I'm getting older now, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting old. But um, I'm sure all of us have people who see us as a threat, maybe. I don't know. But I'm at the point in my life now where I just want to play nice with people and just not fight with people anymore. You know, and just be like, okay, we can all do this together. We all do different things. Maybe we can work in concert. Who knows? But we don't need to be petty, and I I hate these dumb tweets. So sometimes I wish Elon would just keep his mouth shut. I don't know. And finally, before we go, we'd like to tell you about an event that's happening on the Space Hipsters Facebook page in order to raise money for Taking Up Space, a charity which gives Native American girls the chance to go to space camp in Huntsville. Uh, Someone has kindly said they'll match up to $1,000 of donations from the group, which is fantastic as the charity currently needs about uh, $4,000 to make sure they can send the nine children who have qualified this time around, as well as their two chaperones to space camp. Uh, The fundraiser is on May 4th, and there'll be a trivia game with loads of incredible prizes to be won. Seriously, we got some amazing stuff that's to be won. We'll post links to the form to sign up and how to donate, but the first 95 people to make a donation and fill in the form will make it into the Zoom chat. Uh, This is a really great cause, and we hope that you'll want to get involved, or even if you can't make the event, maybe consider donating. Uh, We'll have links in the show notes and on our website if you'd like to do that. This operation is somewhat like the periscope of a submarine. All you see is the three of us, but beneath the surface, so that's all we're giving you this week but pretty packed show a pretty packed show indeed thanks so much for your support and for listening as always please do consider hitting that share button and keep your eyes peeled for some new merchandise coming very soon but don't forget that in space no one can hear you mean Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.